Hello everybody. Thank you so much for joining us for this week's Object Talk. My name is Emma and I am the Engagement Officer at the Jewish Museum London. At the Jewish Museum we exist for all people from all backgrounds and we celebrate diversity in all its forms and promote tolerance amongst all peoples. This is a theme that will be picked up in today's talk. Now you are joining us for our first object talk in March. This month we celebrate International Women's Day and the stories of brave and resilient women in our collection. And our talk today will be led by a very knowledgeable woman, our volunteer Marjorie. Marjorie has been a volunteer at our museum for about 11 years. Uh, in that time, she has welcomed hundreds of visitors of diverse backgrounds to our museum. She particularly enjoys volunteering in our gallery, Judaism and Living Faith. And today's talk will include objects from that gallery. Marjorie, thank you so much for leading today's talk. I will now hand over to you. Well, thank you, Emma, for that kind introduction and timely reminder that we must stand up to ever-present intolerance and injustice. That fits in well with the aims and messages of two important events, Purim on the 26th of February and International Women's Day on March the 8th. The theme of Women's Day, which you can see here, you can see the poster, is Call to challenge to combat gender inequality and social injustice in tandem with a celebration of women of achievement. This open ivory scroll from Italy is a Megillah recording the well known story of Purim, meaning lots, lots cast to determine the day on which to commit genocide and exterminate the Jews of ancient Persia. Right at the top of this Megillah, you can make out a woman holding a sword and balancing a pair of scales, which signify that in 4th century BCE Persia, justice was served. Since this week's object talk falls between these two events, they act as an appropriate starting point for my spotlight tour of objects, which as Emma said, mirror their message of resistance and resilience. Now, it's not only the quest for justice which binds them together. The two occasions share another driving force. Draw, if you will, a mental Venn diagram. Two interlocking circles with one event in each circle. In the middle oval, where they overlap, you spot the connection. Girl power. That's the link, Wonder Woman. Wonder Woman girl just happens to be Jewish, but she is up in the clouds, virtual. But far more realistic and grounded is Nina Salomon, who is a powerful advocate for women's rights and who encapsulates so many qualities of a woman of, of achievement. Her portrait depicts a typical genteel Edwardian lady but does hint at sterner stuff underneath. She was born in 1887 into an intellectual observant British family. Comfortable middle class where a girl had no need to work or do anything but comply with the ideals of the time. Get a husband, especially true for Jewish girls, and dedicate her life to Kinder and Kücher kitchen and children, which tick most boxes on the list of Esit Chayil, a woman of worth, which she did. She was happily married and must have understood the fertility symbols on her ketubah, according to the Mishnah, to be fruitful. She had six children. Some people at that time still maintained that women's brains were supposedly smaller so being a productive scholar, and a Jewish scholar at that, did not fit easily with traditional spheres of society. She was a resistor. Female intellectuals were rare and <laughs> suspect. She wrote reams of essays, critical reviews, translated Hebrew poetry, including Hatikva, and made passages from the Talmud more accessible in the new Mahsa. 
She fought for Jewish girls' Hebrew education. Think of Malala Yusuf Sahawi today from a different heritage and a different time. Nina argued for the right of women to vote in an Orthodox synagogue and preach as she once did. Mainstream politics was men's stuff. Women obviously could not understand how to use a vote even if they had one. She, Nina, was politically active in the fight for suffrage for all. That meant that a politician had to listen to views and demands. Her wish was to promote Zionism in World War I. She died age 47, not yet having tackled the male preserve of the synagogue service. All these people are Jewish. Judaism transcends centuries and geography, irrespective of color, creed, cultural or spiritual diversity. But there remains a huge gender gap. The Bible describes Jews as a stiff-necked people, a strong point when bowing down to idols, but stubbornness is not conducive to tolerance or gender equality when it comes to the Torah scrolls. In Orthodox Judaism, the meticulous calligraphy is entrusted only to the male scribe or sofa. Ancient law decrees that scrolls, such as you see here, be copied by a male, schooled in a male seminary, because he would be aware of and alert to the dangers of misspelling the name of God. If the scroll is blemished by mistake, writing Hashem, that section must be removed and buried. A considerable responsibility. The Megillah you saw at the beginning is a book apart. It is decorated, bright, even frivolous, and was supposedly written by Esther, a woman. It's very long, but does not contain the name of God, who remains hidden, and his deeds are not revealed. It is therefore suitable material for a woman to both write and read. But, and there's always a but, those honored to read the Torah and officiate in an Orthodox synagogue service are still men, while those following proceedings in the gallery apart are the women. This is hotly disputed today in the fight for, gen for religious gender equality. Look closely at this Sefer Torah. The kosher parchment is always plain, so the text has no distraction with no decorations or bright illuminations. But the narratives written within are very colorful indeed. None more so than that of Judith and Holfernes and Delilah the Philistine and Samson. Now, these ladies are better known for their skills with the knife than, a, than inspiring the troops. Nevertheless, they are admired as women of achievement. The book of Ruth relates the story of a lowly widowed Moabite, a tribe not well regarded by the people of her late husband. Ruth was a convert to Judaism and in the face of adversity, supported and followed her mother-in-law Naomi back to the land of Israel which she had left in search for food. There in Israel, Ruth was advised to glean for food and charm Naomi's kinsman, Boaz. She married him and became the ancestress of King David, Melech Israel. The Queen of Sheba was of the highest rank, endowed with legendary wealth and charisma. Her magnificent Ethiopian beauty eclipsed that of Solomon's 100 wives. She converted him, married him, and so the story goes, her descendants are today's Falashas, or more correctly, Beta Israel. And you can see a photo here. 
The Fora, the next lady, was surely the equal of any male. She was married and a supreme multitasker, extolled as a judge, prophetess, saviour of her people, inspirer of warriors and a religious influencer, a woman of achievement par excellence. And her book rests in with the other scrolls in the ark, which you will see here in the Judaica gallery. This is my favourite place for spotlight tours. This gallery is filled with the whispers and tinkles of festivals and rituals, comforting us with objects of resilience and resistance. Our collective history shapes the present and the future. The Ark here in the background originated in the 17th century Venice. Before its home here in the museum, it was a servant's wardrobe in the castle of Chillingham, seat of Sir Humphrey Wakefield, father-in-law to Dominic Cummins, ex-government advisor. A role occupied by Joseph, government advisor and vizier of Egypt, and Haman, chief court advisor to the 4th century BCE King of Persia. To one side, hang a range of ketubot. Now this highly embellished ketubah from Italy represents the first prenup agreement since the 5th century BCE. The text, I can't read it, but have a look at it, stipulates the duties and obligations of the male, but is held by the wife. The Talmud ordains that the wife is entitled to the same status and dignity of the husband. Sarah and Rachel each had their own tents. Respect. The challenge here is that only the man can grant divorce. It is rare, but resistance to withholding divorce is making some headway. Um, it's easy to see the surroundings of this ketubah. They are fertility symbols. The fish, the male lions, the peacock, the many seeded pomegranates, the roses in full bloom, and on the other ketubah, which you can't see, there are lots of baby cherub cherubim. A child born of a Jewish mother, be she queen or pauper, according to halacha, is Jewish. Nearby, we move to the Sabbath table. This cosy little room resounds with the father's melodious welcome to the Sabbath bride, Lachad Odi, and before Kiddush, he recites the Song of Solomon, a, a, a lyrical, a tender lyrical evocation of women of valor, the Eshet Chayil. Now you must agree, Solomon is well qualified to list the 31 virtues of the ideal woman. And here I list a few. Her price is above rubies and pearls. She extends her hand to the needy. Kindness is on her tongue. She is trusted by her husband. Grace is deceitful. Beauty is vain. She does not eat the bread of idleness, a veritable domestic goddess. No pressure there, Nigella. The Sabbath table is an object of resistance and resilience, a physical, spiritual shield against the strain of everyday living right through to the evils of injustice and genocide. A true woman of worth and courage who has experienced these evils is Mala Tribich. The horrors of war and hostile discrimination has marked the lives of Mala, whose picture you see here, and others like her who volunteer at the Jewish Museum and, and go out to tell the world the dangers of intolerance and injustice. She, Mala, rose to the challenges of discrimination and disruption. A soulmate of Anna Frank, 
she realized she relays the message of never again echoed now by demonstrations of enough is enough and black lives matter marla calmly recounts her history of persecution from childhood on loss of loved ones typhoid through to the death camps she pushes against all boundaries, urging us to end injustice and inhumanity, to protect the right to life for all. No greater task has any human being, let alone a woman approaching 90 years. No youngster. But come with me. On the 14th of Adar, we remember a teenager, a young girl who was imbued with the same courage and conviction to save and protect others from injustice and losing the fight to life. Hadassah, Esther of fourth century BCE of Persia, now known as Iran. Esther calmly and cleverly helped reverse the decree to exterminate her people, the Jews. In this image, you see the funny side, the Purim spiel, but it was no game. King Ahasuerus of the mighty empire of Persia had a trophy wife, Vashti. To show off, he demanded she reveal, reveal her beauty to his court. She resisted and dared disobey her husband, starting the Me Too movement, but it didn't do her much good she was beheaded. The quest was on to find a replacement. The search was for unmarried maidens. So Esther, the orphan, must have been a very young teenager to be unwed at that time. Now, to my mind, she could have hidden, masked her beauty in some way, or feigned ineligibility, but not Esther. She was chosen to be the wife of the king, and she was up to the challenge of being an undercover agent for her uncle Mordechai, who had heard Haman, the vile chief advisor, plot the final demise of all Jews in the empire. Mordechai needed a friend at court to act when the time came, and Esther, known now as Ishtar, the star, must have had star quality, mentally and intellectually, to be an accomplice to her uncle, but more importantly, to take action alone, understanding the issues. And I quote, Mordechai urges her, for if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance will arise for the Jews from another place and you and your father's house will perish. Who knows whether you have not attained royalty for such a time as this. Hashem remains hidden. So Esther, unbidden, went to the banquet and begged the king to reverse the final decree, putting her own life on the line. We rejoice and celebrate this woman of achievement today. The, she succeeded. The rattle of the Gregors does, drowns out the name of Haman, but the name of Esther resounds to posterity. She bore Ahasuerus a son. Darius II of the mighty Persian empire stretching far to India. And by the laws of Halacha, Darius was a Jew. Thank you for listening to the Spotlight Tour and Purim Spiel. There's more waiting for you at the Jewish Museum, Camden. Why? Over to you, Emma. Thank you so much, Marjorie, for such a brilliant talk. You've really started off our month of celebrating women's history beautifully, sharing many examples from our collection of strong women in the Torah and the Tanakh, and also strong women in our collection of Jewish history. Thank you so much everybody for joining us for this week's talk. Do join us again next week for another object talk exploring women's history. We will see you there. <laughs>